Hi, and welcome back to Friends and Company. Well, we just came from the woods in, near Camden, Tennessee, of the crash site of Patsy Cline and the others on that plane. And um, we found a fellow who knows all about that. In fact, he was one of the first people that were there. And you know, you hear a lot of stories about what exactly happened the night and the days after the uh, plane crash over there. And we have found a guy who's gonna tell us straight up what the story is. And with us to talk about, about that is Jerry Pfeiffer from Pfeiffer's Country store in Eva, Tennessee, right, Jerry? That's true. Well, first of all, Jerry, you've got a wonderful <coughs> place here. In fact, we'd like to come back someday and do a whole show here. Yeah, you're welcome to. This is wonderful. You've got all kinds of collectibles and antiques and signs and pictures and all kinds of memorabilia. Well, I can tell everybody else I collect everything but money. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> um, go back to that uh, day of the plane crash night. Was it night? And tell us how old you were and what was going on with you then. Well, it was in... It was actually March of 4th, 1963, I was a police dispatcher for the city of Camden. Mm -hmm. That was my first job I ever held. I was approximately 18 years old, fresh out of high school. I worked in the evening shift at the Camden Police Department. I received a call about 7.30 p.m. that night that a plane had crashed near a farmer's home in uh, rural Benton County. I immediately called the Tennessee Highway Patrol and I asked them to have a plane missing. They advised me they did not, but they would do some checking. Furthermore, I went ahead and called the rescue squad out and also the auxiliary police department. And they got out that night and started running the road, which was called the Mount Carmel Road. Mm -hmm. He was out from the city dump, kind of west of Camden, Tennessee, about three miles. Mm -hmm. Now, did somebody hear the plane going down or did they see uh, it? Well, the farmer related to me that gave me the call that he heard a crash. He uh -huh. heard a motor. It sounded like it was sputtering and finally it quit. And then the next thing he heard was a crash, it seemed like. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, it was dark. And that particular night, it was rainy and kind of foggy and misty and the wind blowing and lightning. And it, it wasn't a very good night to be flying, I don't think. Mm -hmm. So we kept the rescue squad out at about midnight. And they called it a night because we thought it'd probably be better the morning to look, and at that time, the Tennessee Highway Patrol was going to furnish a helicopter where we could look through the woods and see better from the air, you know. Yeah. So, some way or another, uh, the Highway Patrol checked with the FAA in Nashville, and they did call me back approximately an hour later and related to me that there was a plane missing. And they related to me on that plane was Patsy Klein, Cowboy Copas, Hawkshaw Hawkins, and Randy Hughes, a pilot. Well, that made things more tense and got some more excitement started among the, the men involved in the search and everything. And some way or another hit the wire services and I started receiving calls from all over the country, you know, mm -hmm. newspapers and uh, radio stations and things of that nature. And I, all I could tell them was just what I knew at that time, you know. Mm -hmm. And so at that time, Cameron had a city hall in the basement of Hall Hardware Store. and. Like you say, in 1963, our police department was very small. Uh, the city hall closed at 2 a.m. in the morning. So I stayed probably 2 or 2.30 and closed city hall and got in the car with the Tennessee Highway Patrolman Troy Odell. He was the officer on duty at that time. And I thought we'd ride around with him the rest of the night and, you know, be on the scene that morning if something did turn up. Well, we did ride that night till about daylight, and the farmer that originally heard the crash went looking back down behind his home and found the crash. So about 6 or 6.15 that morning, uh, he called the Sheriff's Department here in Benton County. In turn, the Sheriff's Department called the Highway Patrol, and in turn, the Highway Patrol called the car that we was in and directed us to the scene told us to meet Mr. Uh, so-and-so, whoever the man's name was. I can't recall at the present time what his name was, either Baker or Hollingsworth, I believe. So we met him, and at that time, we went further down the road, probably one mile, with the top of a hill and parked, and uh, there was a funny feeling came over me at that time. Like I say, I was barely 18 years old, and I thought, well, I said, it's going to be kind of an unusual experience me being, you know, where I'm positioned I'm in. I've never seen anybody you know that's been killed in a, a bad wreck or anything like and that. And at this point you knew there was probably no hope for anybody Survival. to survive. Survival, that's yeah. true. I just, you know, 
and it mm -hmm. felt like there'd be probably death there, you know. Yeah. So I never will forget walking down that hill that morning. Uh, I could say a little mist there, foggy, and I had a funny feeling. My hair seemed like standing straight up on my head, and I kept walking down that hill, and we seen where the plane clipped the top of a tree off. It would come straight in, and the motor went directly in the ground. It made a big hole in the ground. Mm. And where it hit, it hit in a little valley like, kind of a little ravine, I guess you'd call it, down through the mm -hmm. woods there. And where it hit, it's true material all the way down that valley. Uh, I'm talking about pieces of the airplane, uh, part of the entertainment's clothing, and part of their equipment, guitars, amplifiers, and things of that nature. I remember seeing broken guitars. I remember seeing cowboy hats and part of their rhinestone suits and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. and, and I kept walking down that uh, ravine there, and I kept you know, looking for bodies, seeing if I could find any bodies. And I, I couldn't see none, and I, I, that puzzled me. It really did, you know, because I didn't know where the bodies was at. Well, I got about halfway down through where it was. It, it went, I'd say, probably uh, 300 feet, 400 feet probably through it. And there was oil and, and grease and, and, and blood and flesh-like and, and parts of the plane embedded in the trees in the, on the side that the plane was going through. It just threw it right down through there, you know, in twisted wreckage. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got in about halfway, and I got to looking around for bodies, and I couldn't find none. So I helped look down, and, and I was standing on a piece of flesh. Mm -hmm. And that made me feel very, very awful, you know. I, it really upset me very much. And I got looking around, and that all it was was flesh, just pieces. And that gave me a funny feeling. I wasn't expecting anything like that. I was expecting whole bodies, which, you know, uh, normally would being something, you know, or an accident of that nature, but still, I didn't know that much about airplane crash at that time either. But we started searching the area, me and Troy Oval, the Tennessee Highway Patrolman that was with me, and the guy that found the uh, accident, the one farm that was on. So we looked the area over, and we found pieces of flesh, and uh, we found more of Patsy Klein, I'd say, than anyone else. She was wedged in under a log, partly, at the very far end of where all this material was through at. Uh, her torso was always intact, and part of her head and her long black hair was identifiable, the reason we knew it was her. Also, uh, we found one of her feet wedged in a fork of a tree, just like this. It broke off its ankle and a foot just hanging in the fork of a tree. And the reason we knew it was her foot, it had a fairly polish on the toenails. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason we knew it was her foot. So. We kept on looking around, and like I say, there's no life there on the scene. It was a very uh, dreadful scene, and it's something I'd never experienced before and hope never see again. And uh, we called reinforcements in to help. Of course, the ambulance crews arrived, and people started coming, and, and also people started uh, taking pieces of plane off immediately. It's just amazing how things mm -hmm. happened that, that nature. Uh, there's two or three men dug the engine out of the ground and carried it off and Good. pieces of airplane wings and things like that, which I have some pieces myself that I've collected long when I was down there, which I have some guitar strings that I picked up and also a pieces of strut on the airplane. And mm -hmm. I have probably uh, Hawkshaw Hawkins's uh, cuff link. Mm -hmm. I figure that's his and a piece of wire. And also here's a steering column that came out of the airplane. And also I have the a FAA report that they gave the Cameron Police Department at that time uh, to give a report to all the agencies in each county whenever something like that happened. So uh, I talked to the chief, uh, Aubrey Pavard, he was chief of police at that time, and uh, when they gave it to him, I asked him, I said, what are you going to do with that? He told me, he said, well, I'm just going to file it back some more. He said, well, i like to have it. I told him, I said, someday it may be worth something. Collector, he said, well, you'd be more glad I can give it to you. You can have it. So I took it, and I've had all this stuff put at my mother's house put up in a drawer all these years till I opened this store six years ago. Then I displayed it where people could see it and uh, also we can talk about the remind, remainder of what happened on that day. Mm -hmm. So that's about really the extent of what I know about the plane crash, but I do know that me and Troy Ole and the gentleman that the land belonged to at that time, either Hollingsworth or a Baker, one of the names, were the first ones on the scene that morning on March the 5th, 1963. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that's your, you sure give a really 
complete description of everything that happened. I wasn't really sure that we were going to hear that kind of description. Well, but that's uh, that's good to know because you do you hear a lot of stories and and uh, you know you were telling me earlier that you've heard a lot of stories of things that you know just mm -hmm. absolutely didn't happen because yeah, you were there. That's true. Uh, it's something that I never want to see again, mm -hmm. and, and I understand since then there have been a lot of plane crashes, and I know how people are mangled, their bodies are, and mm -hmm. at that time I was naive, see, mm -hmm. I'd never seen any death before, and I was mm -hmm. very naive about that, and it, very, it upset me very much, Yeah. and it took me several weeks to really get that off my mind, and I, I, still, I still think about it very much. It, it might have helped you. Now, you, you went on into law enforcement. You was actually the sheriff here in Benton County that, for a while. That's true. I'm sure that, that seeing that at probably such a young young age probably uh, gave you more of an appreciation for life and, and how fragile our bodies really are and wrecks and things of that nature. So you probably learned something from it, although it was a grisly scene. But this is a, this was a horrible thing to happen, but hopefully uh, they'll get the monument up for them and they'll finally be recognized for their abilities, what they did for the country. They were great musicians and singers, all of them were. And I think it's good that they're getting a monument put up at the place and doing mm -hmm. what they're doing the 4th of July. I think mm -hmm. it's really a good thing. I'm proud to see it. Yeah, I am too. Well, thanks for being on with us this week and explaining about it, telling us the, the real story. Yeah, and uh, we want to come back here sometime and, and just get your whole store. This is the neatest place. It's just like a museum in here. You're welcome anytime. All right. Now, uh, I was holding this piece. You think this was probably a piece of the strut? Yes, it is, and if you look real close, there's some, still some skin right there on it, dried skin. Oh, is that what that That's is? That's what that is. That's dried skin. Okay. It's a little gruesome, I know, but of course, you're talking about 30-something years ago, so yeah. I mean, it's dried, and, but that's true. That's part of the strut, I'd oh. say, of the airplane. And the airplane was probably what? Green? Green, Well, yellow? I'd say green, yeah. There's Piper Comanche four-seater. Mm -hmm. So say it's just a real green small plane. And this here, like I say, the steering column come out of it. It says Piper Comanche on it right there. Mm -hmm. We just broke all the pieces and everything. Oh, yeah. Mm. I mean, it's something to have. It's something to, yeah. you know, to pass on through generations that, you know, something that you can say that, you know, you use there. Mm -hmm. you can't, everybody can't say that. That's right. Well, thank you again for being with us. You're very much welcome. And stay tuned, we'll have more friends and company right after this.